For our experts in emotion interview today, we have the honor of speaking with Dr. Tor Wager. Dr. Wager is the director of the Cognitive and Affective Neuroscience Laboratory at the University of Colorado Boulder and received his PhD from the University of Michigan in Cognitive Psychology with a focus in Cognitive Neuroscience in 2003. He joined the faculty of Columbia University as an assistant professor in 2004 and was appointed associate professor in 2009. And recently in 2010, he joined the faculty of the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, Dr. Wager's research focuses on how expectations shape responses to pain and emotion in the brain and body. His work integrates new and novel analytic and meta-analytic methods, fMRI, and psychophysiology. He's published over 60 articles and received numerous awards, including the Innovation Award from the Social and Affective Neuroscience Society, as well as the Janet Taylor Spence Award from the Association for Psychological Science. His work has been highly featured in media outlets, including the New York Times, LA Times, National Geographic, the Huffington Post, Science Daily, CNN, and more. So I now turn with great pleasure to our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Tor Wager on the question of where exactly is emotion in the brain. So welcome Tor, thanks for speaking with us today. Thanks for having me. So what I wanted to start out asking you a bit about was sort of what got you interested in emotion in the first place? Sort of where did the journey begin for you? I've, I've been interested in emotion for a long time. I started off studying cognitive control in graduate school and working memory, and that's important stuff, but emotion is really important because I think it's an organizing principle that guides how we structure our lives and our everyday interactions. So I think that's why I've been guided towards that for years now. Very cool. So I want to then ask you a little bit about where the years have taken you, you know, since you've gotten interested in this topic. So I mean, You've done a lot of things, and um, so where to begin asking about your work is always a, a challenge because you've done so many exciting things. But one of the things I wanted to start with was just your work where you've conducted this really impressive you know, and widely influential meta-analysis on the neuroanatomy of emotion, um, particularly in the human brain. And I wondered if you could just say a little bit in doing this you know, meta-analysis what you found to be some of the most you know, exciting discoveries out there. Um, yeah, we, we've started, uh, gosh, I think about 10 years ago now, and we've been continuing to do meta-analyses, and we have several things that are ongoing, so it's really a series. I, people started off, I think, with some sort of relatively simple-minded ideas about emotion. Uh, it was, it's been harder to get a handle on emotion than it has other sorts of cognitive phenomena that are easier to study experimentally. So people have these ideas like uh, the, the right hemisphere is the emotional hemisphere. And there's a left-right lateralization for positive versus negative emotion. And what we found with the meta-analysis, for one thing, is that it's much more complicated than that. Uh, the pattern of lateralization is more complicated, and the pattern of interactions that creates a signature for each a different kind of emotion, if there is one, is um, not as straightforward to find. So I think people also started off with the idea that uh, that there's a region that codes for a particular emotion, like the amygdala is fear and the insula is disgust. And um, certainly each of those regions participates in that process, but one of the things that we found is that most of the regions involved in emotional processes participate in multiple kinds of, of processes. So I think it points towards the fact that we have a lot more work to do to understand what the, the signature is of a particular emotional state. So it's not just the amygdala, uh, um, it's something much broader. Uh, you know, one of the things that led us to believe that is if you look at what the amygdala responds to in human neuroimaging studies, it responds to faces, people making facial expressions of emotion. They don't even have to be consciously uh, perceived. And so that's quite different than, than identifying the amygdala with the experience of fear. Yeah, so I mean, it's interesting. It sounds like from this meta-analysis, the land, sort of landscape of where we think about emotion as being sort of, you know, placed in the human brain is much more complex than we could ever appreciate. Um, and from what you're saying, it sounds like this meta-analysis provided an interesting roadmap for maybe where researchers should be, you know, spending their energies moving forward. 
That's right. It's helped us to evaluate what's consistently coming out in the human neuroimaging literature and uh, and, and what's not, and how, uh, how general versus specific are the profiles of activity in different regions. Uh, in our future work, um, we're sort of pursuing that. We're trying to understand, is there a, a, sign a signature for each different kind of emotional state? <laughs> That's really exciting. I mean, one of the other things you've been doing that I think is also really interesting is studying you know, machine learning as sort of one route towards you know, providing specificity as to whether some of these observed patterns, you know, of neural activity might re represent, you know, potential biomarkers of underlying affective processing. And this is also an area I think that's really exciting, really new in this domain. And I wonder, from your perspective, what is some of the promise that this approach could provide for people trying to study, you know, emotion and the human brain? Right. So machine learning uh, encompasses a very broad set of techniques and a very important one for finding patterns from complex multivariate data. And it developed in statistics and computer science for, for those reasons, to find those patterns. Uh, I think it's really important, the application of those techniques to brain imaging data in particular, um, because it does a couple things for us. One is we can ask the questions about, is there a, a unique neural or brain signature for a particular type of process, whether it's pain or, or sadness. I don't think we've yet found pain or sadness or joy or disgust in the brain. We don't really know what, um, what the processes are that contribute to those things, and they probably differ based on the situation. So machine learning offers a way forward to anchor our brain analyses on, these, uh, on the outcomes that we care about on the psychological outcomes that we care about. And so that's very exciting. And I think, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see how machine learning, the, and the use of machine learning evolves uh, as a trend in, in the human neurosciences. Um, I think there's a few sort of holdover ideas uh, that are, are probably um, myths, or at least in, in some ways they're myths. Uh, one of them is that um, machine learning is a complex procedure that yields a very complicated pattern that's hard to understand, and that doesn't have to be the case. Um, and so I think with the right kinds of, of judicious use of those techniques, I really do think that we're going to be able to move forwards towards understanding uh, psychological and, and, um, and, and behavioral principles. Exciting. I mean, so I mean, you've done really neat work using meta-analysis techniques, looking at the role of machine learning, and you've also done some work on a topic that I think is really uh, familiar and controversial to many people, which is the you know, placebo effect. And you've done some really interesting work looking at the placebo effect as it relates to the experience of pain. And I wondered if you could just say a little bit about these findings that have really captivated a wide audience. Right. Um, I I've always been fascinated by the ways in which conceptual processes, things that you think think about, recall from memory, et cetera, can, can influence uh, health-related outcomes. And so you could view placebo effects through this lens. In part, it's a way of understanding how we can, you know, you, you can actually create a laboratory paradigm where you experimentally manipulate someone's beliefs about a situation or about the context, and then you can quantify outcomes that are relevant for, for health and disease in various ways. And so that's kind of, for me, one of the things that's interesting about placebo effects. Um, another, so, and, and, and sort of another angle on that is this, it is clinically relevant. People haven't yet understood or they don't understand what happens, what's, what are the implications of when you uh, give people a placebo treatment in a clinical trial? Um, and does the drug just sort of work on top of the placebo uh, if, if there is a placebo effect? Uh, or, or does it interact with that, um, that, that placebo effect? And so, you know, I think there's, clinically speaking, I think there's this opportunity to contribute to a shift from thinking about drugs and treatments as agents that act on a very simple mechanical system, which is your brain, towards thinking about the brain as a very complex, responsive, not just reactive, evolving system, and the effects of pharmacological treatments operate in this highly dynamic environment. So we really, you know, I think it's the clinical aspect is there's this promise that it can help to put the the brain back into biomedicine, as a colleague of mine <laughs> used to to say. Um, 
And I think from a psychological perspective, it's interesting to me because placebo effects uh, sit at the nexus of conceptual processes and beliefs, um, learning processes, and memory, episodic memory retrieval, and how you recall context, and, and affect, and, and how uh, emotional processes are generated in the brain. And so I think that they're kind of, uh, you know, provides a, a kind of a window into this central integrative organization of how we, how the brain shapes motivation and, and affect. Uh, and so that makes it complicated to study, but also I think interesting in a lot of different directions. <laughs> I mean, one of the interesting things here that people often wonder is sort of, well, how do placebo treatments work in the first place? Like what are the kind of necessary ingredients or components that really make <clears throat> placebo treatments work? And I don't know what your thoughts are on this. Yeah, our, you know, our thoughts are, are evolved. My thoughts are evolving on that, and they've really been shaped by the research that we're doing. So I was surprised, really, honestly surprised years ago when we did the first studies and found out that um, essentially placebo treatments can change the way the brain processes pain. They can cause changes in endogenous opioid release. Um, and so how, how do they work? I think we're still very much figuring that out, but some of the things that we now know, and I think are really important, are it's not just about belief, I don't think. You can manipulate someone's belief without introducing uh, placebo effects on brain processes that are meaningful. Um, and it's not just about conditioning or learning. It's not sort of a passive, uh, you know, behavioristic kind of process because you can give people all the experiences that are consistent with a placebo effect that should create one and not get that. And so the, where we're headed now is towards developing models that combine uh, ideas about learning in the brain and plasticity with ideas about conceptual thought. And the basic core idea is that if you have the right kind of belief and you get the right kind of, of experience to back it up, then there is a, a process of uh, changing the response to especially affective and motivational events in the brain. So that's just a little, a little bit on that. And we're learning a lot, I think, right now. I mean, and you talk about all these things you've done and sort of the next steps and what you're learning and where you're going. And it makes me wonder, from your perspective, someone who really is a leader in this field, you know, where do you see the, the face of the future headed as we, as we look forward and try to decide where to go next? I think there are a number of exciting things happening in our field. Really, I think there's kind of an explosion. Um, for me personally, one of the things that I think is very exciting is the idea of anchoring the psychological concepts of emotion onto brain processes so that we can, and as we make that mapping uh, between brain and emotion, we can then start to use the brain to understand the emotional processes better. So I don't think right now we can, I don't think anybody can really look at a brain scan of any kind and say, oh, this person was feeling joyful and this person was feeling melancholy, or this person was feeling good versus bad. Um, and, but I think that, that it's possible that we could develop those measures. And so for me, I think the idea of anchoring the study of emotions in biology is an extremely important one. And so when students then come to you and ask, you know, where should I be going, you know, as I am embarking in the study of emotion, or what advice do you have for someone like me who's thinking about maybe entering this field, right? What do you tell them? Sort of what is your advice to students who are dabbling or thinking about studying emotion and, and the human brain? Um, I, I think that I think everyone thinks in a very different way. And each person has a profile of, of strengths and weaknesses in the way they think and, and interests. And so I guess my advice to students would be to find something that really fits, to find a, a area of study and a way of studying it that plays to your strengths so that you're capitalizing on what you're really excited about. I think you know, you've got to love what you're doing or, or find a way to do that. You don't have to love everything about it. Um, but that, that's kind of my, you know, my broad advice. And you know, for me personally, I, I like to think about the connections between, I think, what I'm doing and, and lots of different kinds of areas, people doing very different kinds of things, at least as much as possible. Um, 
and I like the technical development. Um, so those things are just exciting to me. I, I do them late at night. You know, I find myself, <laughs> I still program. And, you know, not everybody has to be like that. Um, but, but I think each person can find the way in which they really can contribute in a unique way and, and fit into that. So love what you're doing and also find what you're good at and really go at it, you know, like you, Tor, staying up till late at night, programming away. So sometimes uh, against my better judgment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Tor, thanks for speaking with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jaren. It's really been fun. Oh, thanks. So this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Tor Wager from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Thanks again.